expert and I don't need to be. With FTX, I have everything I need to buy, sell, and trade crypto safely. I'm trading crypto. FTX is the safest and easiest way to buy and sell crypto. It's the best way to get in the game. Like I was saying, it's FTX. It's a safe and easy way to get into crypto. Yeah, I don't think so. And I'm never wrong about this stuff. Never. Cryptocurrency firm FTX was riding high, spending lavishly on celebrity endorsements before it all came crashing down earlier this month, costing investors billions, wiping out the fortune of founder Sam Bankman-Fried, who's now facing investigations from prosecutors and regulators. I sat down with him in the Bahamas this week for his first broadcast interview. It's on you. It's also a potential crime, isn't it? The way that, that I see it, like, look, I screwed up. Like, I was CEO. I had a responsibility here. I had a responsibility to be on top of what was going on on the exchange. I wish I had done much better at that. From my understanding, there were documents drafted up that is, you know, by legal that were covering what was happening. And, um, you know, frankly, I was, there's a lot of other things going on. I have sort of a tendency to be involved in many things, to be, uh, you know, spread thin sometimes. Um, and, but isn't this yeah. the heart of the problem right there? I yes. mean, this is the, the, the reddest of red lines. You don't use money from depositors. You don't borrow money from depositors to give to a, a sister company. That's true, isn't it? I mean, there were explicit mechanisms by which there was uh, allowed borrowing and, and lending on the platform. Um, but I completely agree that it is in general, like a huge warning flag. And uh, I thought that we had had, you know, processes in place that were managing it. I didn't do nearly as much diligence on that as I should have. Um, I, I also really underestimated the you know, risk of um, what a correlated market crash would look like here, which is also something I should have gotten right. Let's get more on the legal and economic fallout now with our chief business and economics correspondent, Rebecca Jarvis, our chief legal analyst, Dan Abrams. And Dan, I, I went round and round with, with Sam many times on this idea of giving FTX depositors money over to Alameda uh, Research. He, he had a hard time answering. He finally landed on, I didn't do anything improper. I call it a red line, but what is the law? Well, look, there's no question that it's improper, right? The question is whether it crosses the, the legal line. Um, and when you're talking about the possibilities of you know, numerous federal crimes here, from wire fraud, securities fraud, et cetera, now, his defense seems to be, I didn't know what was happening at my own company. And we've actually seen that a lot with CEOs who are indicted. The defense ends up being, I know this is hard to believe, but I didn't but actually... they have a fiduciary responsibility, Of course they do. They? Of yeah. course they do. But as a legal matter, you still need a level of intent to commit the crime. And his basic defense, it sounds like, is, I didn't have the intent. I wasn't trying to do it. That's not enough in a lot of cases. That's not going to protect him necessarily from getting indicted. Um, but it is something we hear from CEOs who get tried, and it almost never works. Now, Rebecca, give us some sense of the scale of the losses here for investors and its impact on the crypto industry overall. Well, George, when you look at crypto overall, about a year ago this time, the whole industry was $3 trillion. Today, it's about a $900 billion industry. It's come down a lot because a lot of cryptocurrencies have dropped and also because of what's happened inside of FTX. And that is smaller than Apple at this point. The entire industry is smaller entire than Apple. industry. Yeah. It's half the size of Apple as an entire company. I think one of the things that the finance community is really looking at here is how FTX was built. So Dan talks about whether or not he knew. He built the accounting that this company was based on. He created both he, companies. He <laughs> created both companies. He owned the hedge fund, Alameda Research, and he partly owned FTX and got a lot of investors into it. That was built on top of Alameda. And where the finance community is really looking at this is where are the regulators right now? Where are the policymakers right now taking a closer look at this story? Because a lot of people have lost a lot of money and we don't even know the extent. A lot of, of people yet. lost a lot of money, but you sort of answered my second question in your answer saying this whole industry is smaller than Apple. I've been a little bit surprised that this collapse in the crypto industry hasn't spread into the broader financial markets. Well, and one big reason for that is that the collateral that the rest of the industry would accept 
is not crypto. So for example, when we saw the housing collapse, the collateral behind the housing collapse was the U.S. housing market. In this case, we're talking about crypto. You can't walk into Tokens. a bank right now and say, I've got a token and I want to buy a home. That doesn't work. But to your point, there are economic ripple effects from this. Cryptocurrency have been the underpinnings of things like some exotic car markets, uh, the, the booming um, going out market, bars, clubs, that kind of thing. The Bahamas is already seeing this because of where uh, FTX is based in the Bahamas. They're saying they're seeing it. Places like Miami are starting to see it. This has been an underpinning of spending in the U.S. economy for segments of the U.S. economy, especially young people. Dan, the regulation of the whole crypto market is pretty murky right now, but it, Sam Bankman-Fried apparently must have defied all of his lawyer's advice to do a two-hour interview like that, and he's continuing to talk. Absolutely, and you have to wonder, what is he doing, right? Why is he talking to so many people? And it seems that there are two basic groups he's probably trying to talk to. Number one is the public, court of public opinion, trying to convince people, feel bad for me. I, it wasn't my fault. That's a tough sell. Tough also sell. Also saying he feels bad for all the investors. Who yes, yes. Um, that, that, that's not going to be an easy sell. The other one is, if, if I thought that he could somehow convince prosecutors or regulators not to charge him by going public, I would say, great, that's a really smart strategy. But I don't see how that could possibly be helping. Meaning, the way to do that, if you're, if you're serious about trying not to get charged in a case like this, would be to talk to them would be to have a conversation where you would agree to speak to, to prosecutors or regulators. He's going public. That annoys prosecutors and regulators. They get irritated by that. And everything he says can and will be used against him. And it's the nuances sometimes, right? It's even the small differences between at one point saying, well, I was nervous about what was happening, and then at another point saying, well, I, I wasn't really that concerned. Well, I was vaguely aware. Right, right. And those sorts of distinctions could end up being critical in any case. And we're talking about, by the way, the possibility of up to life in prison. You're talking about the economics of this. The amount of the dollars matters. When you're talking about this much money, in the federal sentencing guidelines, you're talking about the possibility of enhancement after enhancement after enhancement based on the dollar amounts that could lead to something up to life. Many more twists in this story. Dan Abrams, Rebecca Jarvis, thanks very much. Our one-hour special, Billions Missing, Inside the FTX Crash, is streaming now on Hulu.